to see folks. Good to be with all of you. I, I need to confess something. I really, really, really hate this subject. I despise it. I mean, this is, in 2001, I was a co-founder of a think tank in Washington, D.C. called the New America Foundation, and we had some folks like Eric Schmidt, now, now the executive chairman of Google, but he was at Novell, uh, Zoe Baird at the Markle Foundation. He said, you know, we have a digital divide coming in this country, or here in this country. We need to fix it. We need action plans. We need a this is 2001. We got a huge spread of the New York Times, and we're still at it. Mm -hmm. So I just want to basically put a punctuation point on both the seriousness of the questions we're going to be asking, but I just want to say, for all of you in this game, for some reason we haven't done as much as we should have in 15 years or 16 years. So, Stu, I want to just start with this for a minute. Is it a matter of connectivity, or is it a matter of our own, is, is, is the issue of getting, uh, of closing the gap a psychological one, a social one, or is a physical infrastructure one? It's a little of both. Uh, access, obviously, is the immovable barrier in uh, Leah's district. Uh, so physical, uh, being connected yeah. to a piece of fiber. Yeah. In Leah's okay. district in Monroe County, which is probably uh, the, the ground zero of the digital divide, uh, less than 3% of the homes have access to 25 meg download speed, which is the FCC standard. And only one in four have access to 10 meg down. And so it's, it's an access issue there. However, mm -hmm. in urban areas, uh, we see low adoption generally because of cost. So, uh, you know, really it's, it's a tale of two cities. One is the access, which again, that's an immovable barrier. If you don't have that, you, you can't get adoption. But there's also an issue with the adoption rates in the more urban areas too, which can be generational, it can be cultural. Uh, people may think it's not relevant. Uh, some parents, not so much the kids, uh, but sometimes the parents are hard to persuade. But we, we, you know, I heard, I, I, I was eavesdropping on your conversation in the green room, and I don't know exactly what you do, but I heard a little bit about New Mexico. I used to work for the senator of New Mexico in the 1990s, and this was a big issue when you're dealing with rural areas and rural urban divide questions. I've always wondered if, you know, over this time, we now have a generation that's passed from the period I've talked, you know, talked about, where the rewards for being connected to me seem so right. obvious, and the impact and consequences on people who have not had that environment richly and robustly around them don't have. They, they've got to work harder to get up the hill. And maybe that helps them out. But, but it don't, why, isn't, why aren't those areas that are sort of disconnected clamoring, demanding, <laughs> screaming for fair treatment? Yeah, and I will say there's other states that have passed legislation that, that has made some difference. But you know, quite frankly, there, regardless of the technology, there's going to be uh, areas that, that are not feasible to build out mm -hmm. in. And uh, we have to look at, at assisting uh, those development costs. They're, they're driven by consumption, which is largely driven by density. Uh, the cost of fiber is about $30,000 a mile. And if you only pass four households, uh, it's going to be hard to, to, to make that math work. Uh, but then when you combine the other, the other aspects of, of economic development and telehealth and, and, and jobs and education and all those things, we're getting to a point that, that the economic development as based as a result of that investment starts to, to reach a tipping point where we have to do something. Leon, I know you're, you're, um, you are from, not, you're from Cleveland. Yeah, do, you, do, you, do you talk to Columbus people very often? Do you like <laughs> encounter each other often? I mean, is this a different bubble for you? Do you guys get along? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I've only been in Cleveland two years, so yes. Uh -huh. I would say yes. <laughs> Yeah, you, you get along. Is there any part of Ohio you probably particularly don't like? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it, you, with with the foundation and what you're doing to try and address some of these other issues, what is? I, I guess you know, there's a way to look at this as so comprehensive. There's so many different issues involved. But what are the needles you push? Well, think, considering the fact that the Cleveland Foundation, we're a community foundation, so we're always concerned about the quality of life of residents in Cuyahoga and Lake and Geauga County. What we're trying to figure out and unpack is specifically what Stu said is how is this new economy affecting our investments in education, in economic development, workforce development, health and human services, youth development, and so forth. And a lot of times what we're beginning to argue is that it is impairing our investment if we're going to pour a lot of money into investing into um, Cleveland Metropolitan School District to help with um, digitizing the classrooms and, provide, and improving classrooms and so forth. But yet our kids, when they go home, don't have internet access in a lot of um, low-income neighborhoods throughout Cleveland. Then what is that doing as far as impairing their ability to keep up with their homework, 
to stay engaged or having to make serious decisions about whether I, involve, whether I enroll in extracurricular activities after school. Mm -hmm. Because if I stay and hang out after school past mm -hmm. 5, 6 o'clock, I can't make it to the library that closes at 7 because that's the only place where I'm going to get to a public computing center. So whereas in some more affluent communities, the children can go to extracurricular activities and then go home and stay, on and stay online from 8 to 10, 11 o'clock and still get their homework done, some of our youth have to make a decision about that, and we wonder if that's right, if that's fair. So we're always looking at it from the equity and inclusion aspects of so it. So how do you fix it? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So we're trying to... So you uh, don't know? Well we, well, we do know that there is an issue with access and there is an issue with availability, um, is an issue with cost and so forth. So what we're trying to really do is figure out how can we bring the right partners together, how can we engage our anchor institutions to create a model that is inclusive for everybody. You're absolutely right. The model that we currently have right now based on consumption and private market isn't working for everyone. So what can we do as a foundation to help accelerate and plug that hole? Does this E-rate program that I hear about, that I, and, I, and I don't know for sure, I've been told by a number of FCC commissioners it has become more nimble and flexible uh, than it used to be. So why don't you just tell us what you think of E-rate? You're asking me? Yeah. Okay. As, as you, don't, you don't look um, as very uh, enthusiastic <laughs> about E-rate. No, no. Um, from what I gather, and I haven't followed it immensely, but um, that part of it is just the application process right. and getting through all the red tape and so forth. Those school districts that have the right personnel that know how to navigate the system are able to benefit from that. Those who don't or are trying to figure their way out um, basically fall behind. So uh -huh. the system itself seems to be um, seems to be fine. It's more of an administrative issue, at least I, what I'm hearing. Stu, I'm you're nodding. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a wonderful program, and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to see it bolstered even more. Uh, however, it can be underutilized mm -hmm. um, if we leave it up to the school systems to apply for those. Sometimes, especially smaller schools, don't have the resources uh, to do that. Oftentimes, they'll hire a consultant, and sometimes that works out. And, other times it doesn't. Also, it gets confusing as to what is an e-rateable um, event. Uh, is wireless um, connectivity uh, uh, e-rateable or not? Is infrastructure e-rateable or not? Is a laptop that somebody can take home e-rateable or not? And why not? Um, it would be my point. I mean, it seems to me that one way we could correct the problem with the laptops mm -hmm. is have them in included with a with a SIM card and a package and and when they get to school, they, they, they have that laptop for the year, and they can go home, or at least there might be mobile coverage, and, and make that an e-rateable e event. But at the current time, it's not. Leah, let me ask you a question, tough question. Pretend Leon here and Stu, they work really hard at trying to get everybody connected in Ohio, but, you know, they just can't pull it off. It's just you are <laughs> permanently isolated. I mean, relatively isolated. If I did my math right, 7% of you know, connected homes and, and, and your teacher. So help's not coming. What do you do? Well, we've been really lucky in the last three years, our school district applied for grants and all of our high schools are, uh, have Google Chromebooks one-to-one, -one, which has been really great So can for you explain us. for the lay people here that don't, I mean, I don't, I saw that in your bio, but yeah. I don't know what that means. Um, we each have, each student has their own laptop for a whole year, like he was talking about. Um, the thing is though, they don't have, it only has internet access where there's Wi-Fi. So they get a computer at the beginning of the year and they sign a release. Um, we've been fortunate that we've been slowly getting more money to where we can move the previously used Chromebooks to the seventh and eighth grade. Um, but the problem that we still face is those kids don't have it at home. Um, so even though they have it at school and they're getting to use new technology on a regular basis, we have to be aware as teachers to make sure that they have time at school to get the assignments completed that are online. Are there other parts in the community that provide, you know, basically Wi-Fi hubs? I don't know, McDonald's, Starbucks, probably bad for students' health, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but are there other hubs? Is, is the community, is the private and the public sector working together at all to provide those hubs? We do have, um, I actually have, um, in our community, we started the College Credit Plus program a couple years ago, and I had a student actually last year that that was one of her concerns was that she didn't have very good internet at home, if ever at all, so she would go to McDonald's to turn in her work for that class because it was all mostly online. Mm. Um, so they will use those resources. Uh, we do have libraries that are really used in the community that I live in. Um, it's actually created by the people who lived in the community. It's a privately funded library 
that connects with the state of Ohio's library system, but they primarily do it to provide internet and access for research for students because they knew that there was a need. So if Stu missing. and Leon did succeed and they were able to kind of overcome the structural access issues more at the home, do you think that the opportunities or the behavior of your kids would change? Uh, well, I think that we do have some areas that have access, but it's really inexpensive and it's really hard for the students to use. Um, right. And so they have, we've, we work really hard to incorporate technology into our classroom a great deal to work, do research or to work collaboratively together. Um, and so I think if we can provide those areas more often that I think they, they've already are starting to benefit with what we've been doing so far, but they're still not getting all of the benefits. What would you guys do in, in, in um, I, I, all I know is Appalachia, what is, what is your town called? Uh, our, our school district Switzerland of Ohio, but it's mostly in Monroe and parts of Belmont. It's about three hours away. Mm -hmm. so, so gentlemen, what would you say are, you know, if this were to be the pilot community or communities like that, what, what would be the ways in which you would begin breaking down some of the access barriers that, that Leah and her students are dealing with? Well, I, I'd say, first of all, Ohio, uh, comparatively is is a leader when it comes to connectivity at schools uh, nationwide mm -hmm. it, it there's still a lot of work to be done uh, but uh, we started an initiative back in the 90s and we we're one of the best uh, connected k through 12 uh, systems in the nation uh, we also do real well with our universities with public safety with government agencies but when it comes to commercial and residential there is no apparent strategy mm -hmm. uh, we've left it to the free market or to the feds to figure out. Other states have, have developed a, a strategy to attack uh, situations like this, where, where the math just simply uh, doesn't work. So I think it's a combination of, first of all, you know, we have to have a strategy. There's nobody to call. I wish we had as much emphasis on our ch child's education as it goes to broadband as we do with autonomous vehicles. You know, it seems mm -hmm. that that's more of the, the flavor of the day, and we've kind of forgotten about you know, what to do with these kids that can't do their homework. McDonald's is great, but how many McDonald's are there in Monroe County? You know, it's a, it's a long drive mm. to get to, to McDonald's. Uh, so then secondly, I think there needs to be coordination with all the other agencies. You know, broadband's a pervasive uh, technology. It, it, it may not be a good model just to, to connect one household, but when you compare that with telehealth and all the mm. other, uh, a comprehensive strategy that looks in into, into autonomous vehicles as part of an overall solution, not a siloed approach. So work with other agencies like the Department of Transportation if they have a dig once policy. If they have a trench open, let's put some conduit down. Let's work with the other agencies that, that may need emergency services and some other things and have a comprehensive uh, approach to that and make the deployment costs more efficient because we can't build the consumption. The consumption is what the consumption is. And that's, while it's going up by osmosis, more of us are using more and more and more. Uh, Monroe County is never going to have a population that's really going to see a spike, nor, nor is that necessarily desired. That's why a lot of people like to live there. So the only way we can affect the math is to get the deployment costs uh, a little bit lower. And even then, we'll probably need a little bit so of So I want to ask you all about this. How many of you will admit to having visited Washington, D.C.? Uh, some of you, yeah, there, there's some of you, not too, I mean, a lot of people just, Washington's the most hated town in America, so, you know, <laughs> don't want to out you guys, but, but there's a place here called Halcyon House, which is a sort of a social incubator, but they have a lot of business groups. I interviewed Congressman Will Hurd from Texas, who's, who's on, involved in cyber and IT. They did this thing, it was very interesting. I met these two, two or three entrepreneurs with a company called Traxel, and what Traxel mm -hmm. does, it's a company, they've developed a way to lay fiber um, uh, in the paint dividers yeah. of, of roads. Yeah. And they're doing it at the other OSU, down in Stillwater, Oklahoma, uh, where near where o Oklahoma State is. Never and, heard of it. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't want to mention it. Yeah. But, 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 you know, I, I find it interesting because what's driving that, particularly for rural communities, they can lay this thin fiber very resiliently in the, uh, uh, in the paint, I guess, on the, on the, on the road. And, and it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I guess it's truck tested. But the design of it is to deal with these digging costs and pole costs and other <laughs> things like this where, where you've got um, a lot of land, uh, uh, a lot of, you know, you don't have the density of the urban environment. And so I don't know if Traxel is the right 
answer, but it does raise the question of whether mm -hmm. technology will solve this problem or not. And it won't, because the math yeah. will still end up, there'll still be places where that investment makes more sense mm -hmm. than somewhere else. And it, regardless of the technology, at some point, there's going to be a math problem. Um, mm -hmm. But in, 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 in the same sense, if, if you work together with, for example, you know, we do have a dig once policy when it comes to federal interstate, interstates. Right. We have fiber running across the, uh, the Ohio Turnpike. But there's, there's not a, a statewide strategy or, or zoning and permitting mm -hmm. that allows a carrier to understand if they are on one side of the street, they'll have one side of, of, of regulations, then they get into another right. uh, township, and there's a whole new set of, uh, mm -hmm. of regulations. There, there's no consistency or, or safety for a, pro, uh, for a provider to make a, an investment that he, he knows what those regulations on the deployment costs are going to be. So, you know, when I find, when I hear that kind of story, and when I ask, you know, Leanne, since you're a foundation, so you're like the guy with money, right? You give money out, you're, you know, you've got power. <laughs> um, I'm interested, when, when, when California had um, solar power standards for distributed power, one of the things you would hear from people who would put this in, so is that every county had different, different regulations, different standards, mm -hmm. so you'd have your deployment times were different, your treatment of the people that were doing installation was dealt with differently. And, and I had mentioned, just like conference like this, is, well, why don't you get a system where one county can embarrass the other, where you can basically have a county demonstrate how fast its absorption or success rate, and then measure the success rate of others. Have you thought of those kind of ways to sort of even it out and, 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 you know, given what you do, which is to try to create a healthy environment that improves quality of life, et cetera, within uh, uh, the Cleveland area, are you able to kind of even out some of this by, you know, shaming the parts of the community that are doing poor and celebrating the parts of the community that are doing well in a way that becomes replicable? We wouldn't call it shame, we call, we call it incentivizing. Incentivizing, yeah. <laughs> um, Whatever works. <laughs> But yes, um, so we do spend a lot of time talking with county, talking with city, especially when you're talking with the county, you got multiple, you got probably about 50 plus municipalities just right. in Cuyahoga County alone. So if we can start with the county and really find ways we create models that we can bring on board different municipalities at the city level mm. um, to try to find that kind of shared system so that you're not bouncing back and forth in disparate systems. Um, we have a very transit, transient population. Um, you have kids that are, they have two different addresses within a school year. So how are you addressing that? So while we definitely want to tackle broadband to the homes, and we definitely want to provide public Wi-Fi capabilities, what our concern is, is that public Wi-Fi still safe and secure? I really don't want to see all of our kids basically having to go to the McDonald's to fill out their FAFSA, mm. um, to fill out all their <laughs> college education, and send mm. all that sensitive information. We, we wouldn't want it for our kids, so why would we want it for, for, for the, for the low-income kids that just have to rely on free internet access within the Panera Breads and so forth in order to get that. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about even about Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, it needs, there needs to be a, a secured model for that, whether it's in the library systems and community centers and other community development corporations, whatever anchor asset within that neighborhood, within that community, that can be that hub while we're still tackling broadband to the home. Mm -hmm. Leah, I want to put you on the spot again just before we go to the audience and ask them. How long have you been teaching at River High School? Um, Twelve years. Twelve years. So have you had any kind of miraculous successes? I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear just a human story of some of your students where being connected, playing in this new ecosystem has really changed someone's life, if it has. Well, I think that in the last few years it's been very helpful because when I first started teaching at River, I had we had a computer lab but it had a class in it and so I'd always have to schedule the projects or time for them to use that whenever the teacher could let us in. So the fact that we have these new capabilities every day has been really beneficial for kids. I think it allows them to be more creative. Um, we've always had excellent academics at our school and have always had students who've done very well and gone on to get scholarships but I think it's opened mm -hmm new paths for them, new careers, new places that... So it sounds like your community is very supportive of the schools, yes, they but are. it's just not connected right. as, as, as equitably as other communities are. Right. It are is, they angry about that? They Actually, I, I teach a yearbook class, which is all online. I was editor-in-chief of my yeah. yearbook. I love you. <laughs> and um, and I, I enjoy that class. Your book uh, is always underestimated. It is. It, Anyway, I had to get that <laughs> <Yeah>. in. <laughs> um, I have nine students in that class, and six of them only have um, internet at home on a regular that's high quality. And mm. when I told them I was coming here and asked them, 
Um, th they, the three that don't have it were very angry about it because they said it's really hard for them to do their homework. Um, even one of the students' moms tries to work from home, but because they have a plan where they only allowed so much mm -hmm. data a month, that uh -huh. sometimes even the mom has to go to a Wi-Fi spot to complete her work. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very angry about it, that it's not readily accept, you know, accessed at home. Um, and that kind of keeps them not only from them, but from their parents accessing different types of jobs too. So that's fascinating. So you've got the demand, but not the access. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I think we have the access and not enough right. Right, good yeah. demand. But with that, let me uh, turn to uh, those for comments and questions. We got a gentleman all the way in the back over here. How many of you were in your book? Hi, I'm Mark Lomax <laughs> from, oh, hi. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> were you in your book? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we've been talking, I'm Mark Lomax from the Columbus Foundation, we've been talking about broadband and Wi-Fi access, but uh, what about other emerging technologies like Li-Fi? Hmm. How does that relate, or does it, to infrastructure and um, deployment costs? So Li-Fi. Li Stu, do you follow Li-Fi? I don't, Mark. So can you, you give us a quick... You, Oh, I knew yeah, you'd do this too. case, 30 right. second, like, uh, yeah. short oh, form. Oh, okay. There's yeah. a great TED Talk on it, but yeah. it's essentially uh, information sent through light. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Interesting. Interesting. So light-generated yeah. connectivity. My understanding is there's been some experimentation on that. And, and we also got small cell technology, which is, mm -hmm. is, is, is you know, huge, uh, where now uh, rather than having a big, uh, big tower, we can, we can put... Uh, uh, access points that are about the size of a deck of cards and you can stack them. Uh, but they all still have to get to fiber. Mm -hmm. at, at some point, you've got to get to fiber. You can microwave it for a while, uh, but it, until you get a good middle mile connectivity closer to that neighborhood, you're going to have you know, capacity issues. But again, I, I just, if technology was the cure, Leah's students would have DSL. Hmm. DSL's been out for 15 years. It's, it, technology is not going to get I mean, there's still going to be areas that the math just doesn't work. I'm trying to leave us in an optimistic note. You're not helping. <laughs> then don't talk. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Doug McCullough from the city of Dublin. Hi, Stu. Hi, Doug. Uh, I want to put out before you, instead of a shaming model, more of a sharing model, because I think some communities that have access to this are seeing that if the community next door or elsewhere in the state does not, it actually harms us. And we can oh. share the information on how we were able to do these things as are, easily. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but are you pretty well connected in Dublin? Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. And uh, one of the things we're doing around the state is going to other parts of the state and saying, listen, this is how it can work for you and being more of an advocate. And I think well-connected places need to share rather than saying, hey, we did it and you didn't. Hmm. That's not a good model for our state. That makes sense. A better model is to go out and say, hey, we did it, here's how you can, let's share with you, and, and our state can benefit. So what's the top needle you moved? Uh, we managed to buy a bunch of fiber in the 90s when everyone else wasn't willing to make a bet on it. Hmm. Yeah. Thought re re any reactions to that, Leon? No, I, I agree on the sharing model, especially when you talk about, um, when you look at Cleveland, you have a lot of inner ring suburbs that can't afford to do it on their own, but if they can share it through, let's say, the county or through um, Cleveland, um, the city of Cleveland, uh, yeah, any way we can do to share to bring down the costs, I'm all in. Do you have places, I mean, I, I, when I was in Cleveland for the convention this year, you have Cleveland Clinic in the middle of everything. Every, mm -hmm. Everybody sort of seems to be related or has done something with it, but you would have very uneven communities. And, yes. and it, 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 I mean, I hate to put you on the spot on this, but is Cleveland Clinic a help or a hurt in, in in doing something? Are they doing what they should be doing to look at communities, invest in them, and, and create opportunity? I mean, it's such a powerhouse in the world. Right. I sort of felt, honestly, not knowing it, if, if it's them or not, are, should they be doing more than they're doing to help solve some of these problems? They're actually doing a lot more than probably they have been. So we've been partnering with the Cleveland Clinic to really look at workforce development and how can we get um, the residents that live around the clinic to work for mm -hmm. the clinic and have meaningful waste jobs are there. Now what we're trying to do is say, what can we do more? So you look at the Cleveland Clinic, you look at University Hospital, you look at Case Western Reserve, three anchor institutions that are pretty much you know, a mile or two away from each other. And over the last five or 10 years, we've been, um, trying to, we, we've been looking at ways that we can collaborate together. 
the broadband piece, the internet connectivity, the building the equity, yeah. and that's probably the next hurdle that we have to tackle with the clinic. Cleveland Clinic's done a lot. They, they've done some telehealth uh, training mm -hmm. uh, for inner city folks. Um, also, one thing is uh, we do have uh, bipartisan, bicameral uh, legislation that's been introduced uh, for broadband development. Uh, Representative Smith uh, on the House side uh, introduced uh, House Bill 378, and on the Senate side, uh, Democrat leader uh, Schiavone introduced Senate Bill 199. And so the General Assembly is very behind this. We've got 24 bipartisan, bicameral co-sponsors. Good. Take a look at it. Good, thank you. A quick question for Leah. If somebody has a question for Leah, comment for Leah. <laughs> oh, come on. You guys are shy. This guy right in the middle. Yeah, you touched your nose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right there. The guy that's high right there. You got a question for Leah, don't you? Yeah. Wow. See, you, you, would, you would have bought the painting at the auction. <laughs> All right. My name is Chris Shea. I'm a professor of learning technology at Ohio State. So I have a question for Leah now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So you have the one-to-one -one initiative in your schools. How are the teachers using it, and are they Great using question. it effectively to promote students' learning? Perfect. I knew he had that. <laughs> uh, we, I think it's, we've been developing it over the last few years, and we have been using it a lot, not only for research, but letting the students collaborate through Google. Uh, if you ever use Google, you can collaborate on Google Documents and allowing them to create projects together, um, allowing them to work on different types of projects that they might not have time normally because of the access to technology. So we have been using a lot. We've been trying to use it more also for testing because state testing is all online mm -hmm. to allow the students to be more familiar with that. Well, thank you. I want to thank Leah Halsey of the River High School, Leon Wilson of the Cleveland Foundation, and Steve Johnson of Connect Ohio. Thank you for enlightening us on this subject.